Why do we have to analyze a literary piece? What is the best literary approach to use? If you want to know more about literary criticism, this video is for you. between lang and parole. Lang is an idealized abstraction of language, while parole is the language as actually used in daily life. He argued that a sign is composed of a signified and a signifier. A sign is any word you may see in English language. Signified is the mental concept that a signifier refers to. Signifier is a marker like a word that refers to a specific concept. For instance, the signifier is tree. You might think of a pine tree or any other tree, but I'm thinking of a Nara tree. The word tree may ring different mental concepts, hence there is no fixed meaning attached to the word. 2. Arbitrary relationship between signified and signifier. According to Zuzu, the meaning of the word is culturally constructed. For instance, your idea of God may have a different mental concept than others. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is connected to the word God. If you're a Muslim, Allah is connected to the word God. The word God can mean differently for everybody. That is what Susu meant by arbitrariness in language. There is no fixed sign. 3. Binary relationship between words. Because different languages have different words to refer to, signs gain their meaning from their relationship and contrast with other signs. In other words, when we try to define things, we start with what they are not. For instance, Ivana Alawi is famous because she's not insignificant. We say, it's cold because it's not hot. A dog is a dog because it's not a rabbit. It's not a cat. 
It's not a fish. So how do we define dog? We define dog by contrasting it to other things which is not. What are the strengths and weaknesses of structuralist literary approach? Structuralism enables us to approach texts historically or transculturally in a disciplined way. However, it is difficult to know who controls the meaning and readers look only at the linguistic structure and is not permitted to have emotional attachment to the text. Let's take a look at the first stanza of the poem The Song of Autumn by French poet Charles Baudelaire. Soon we shall plunge into cold darkness, farewell vivid brightness of our short-lived summers. Already I hear the dismal sound of firewood falling with clatter on the courtyard pavements. The first stanza may be interpreted as the man is chained between the seasons of life that inevitably passes. Summer is too short and winter is fast approaching. Eventually, everything will come to an end and all that will be left is memory. Or, it could be interpreted as the current physical and mental state of the poet. The warmth of summer is represented as happiness and joy of the poet, while the winter signals cold and dark time. So what is a formalist literary approach? It refers to a critical approach that analyzes, interprets, or evaluates the inherent features of a text. These features include not only grammar and syntax, but also literary devices such as figures of speech and meter. The formalist literary approach reduces the importance of texts, historical, biographical, and cultural context. In other words, formalist literary approach is concerned only with the form and sets aside all other aspects such as cultural, biographical, and historical aspect. Now let's talk about a bit of its history and proponents. Formalist literary approach began in Russia in 1916 by two groups, Moscow Linguistic Society led by Roman Jacobson and Prague Linguistic Circle led by Viktor Sholosky. Formalists place an emphasis on the medium by analyzing the way in which literature especially poetry, was able to alter artistically or make strange common language so that everyday word could be defamiliarized. For example, you want to tell your friend she is beautiful. Instead of you saying you are beautiful, you say you are like a flower. That is what defamiliarizing is all about. You try to understand metaphors, simile, and all that, and try to understand the text without taking into consideration outside influences. You are fixed on the text alone. What are the strengths and weaknesses of a formalist literary approach? Strengths. Criticism is done without research. Emphasizes the value of literature apart from its context. Makes literature timeless. Weaknesses. Text is viewed in isolation. Formalism ignores the context of the work. Reduces literature to nothing more than a collection of rhetorical devices. Since the formalist literary approach is applicable to poetry, it is also necessary that we study the elements of poetry. Lines. The group of words arranged into a row that ends for a reason. Stanzas. The series of lines grouped together and separated by empty lines from other stanzas. Form. The overall structure of a poem. There are three general types of poem. Lyric poetry expresses thoughts and feelings. Narrative poetry tells a story. Descriptive poetry describes the world, a person, or an object. Rhyme. The repetition of similar sounds at the end of each line. Rhythm. The recurrence of stressed and unstressed sound in poem. Meter. The unit of rhythm or the pattern of beats. Persona. Refers to the person speaking in the poem. Addressee. Refers to whom the poem is dedicated. Sound devices. 
used to stress sounds and create musical and dramatic effect in the poem. Here are the sound devices that a poet may use. Alliteration, the repetition of initial consonant sounds in two or more words. Assonance, the repetition of vowel sounds in two or more words. Consonance, the repetition of consonant sounds in two or more words. Onomatopoeia, the words that imitate natural sounds of things. Aside from poems, formalist literary approach is also applicable to short story. So here are the elements of a short story. Setting, the time and place of the story. Characters, the people or inanimate beings that carry the action of the story. Plot, the series of events of the story. The plot is divided into the following. Exposition, establishes the setting, conflict, and overall introduction of the text. Rising action, the events of the story begin to create suspense as the characters faces conflicts. Climax, central turning point of the story which carries the highest amount of suspense. Falling action, the section in which the tension decreases and the story moves toward its conclusion. Denoma, the final part of the story. Other elements are Conflict, the struggle between two opposing forces and provides tension in the story. Theme, the message the writer is trying to convey through the story. Point of view, the perspective from which a story is told. Tone, the way the author expresses his attitude through his writing. Mood, the emotional atmosphere within the story produced by the author's use of language. Style, technique of the author in writing. Here are the literary devices. Simile, a figure of speech in which two dissimilar objects are compared and the comparison is made clear by the use of terms like such as and like. Metaphor, a figure of speech where comparison of two different things is implied but not clearly stated. Hyperbole, the use of exaggeration as a rhetorical device. Personification, a figure of speech in which an idea or thing is given human attributes and or feelings. Imagery, the use of figurative language to evoke sensory experience or create a mental picture for the readers. Symbolism uses symbols such as words, people, marks, location, or abstract ideas to represent something beyond literal meaning. Allusion a brief or indirect reference to a person, place, thing, or idea of historical, cultural, literary or political significance. Irony, the use of words to express something other than and specially opposite of the literal meaning. Foreshadowing, is used to hint events yet to come and to keep the readers guessing. Now let's see how we can apply structuralism in Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Men, an excerpt from the play As You Like It. The Seven Ages of Men all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shiny morning face creeping like a snail and willingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly, with good cape unlined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut full of white sauce and modern instances, so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful host well saved a world too wide, for his shrunk shank 
and his big manly voice turning again toward childish trouble pipes and whistle in his sound last scene of all that ends his strange eventful history is second childishness and near oblivion sans teeth sans eyes sans taste sans everything shakespeare's seven ages of man is an analogy of the different phases of life that a man goes through during a lifetime the use of imagery metaphor and simile are the strongest figures of speech used to drive home the message of the passage he starts out with describing the common actions and conditions in which we all find ourselves as a baby who is dependent on a mother figure then he moves on to describe what each stage thereafter looks and acts like in its own time thereby making his way to the end of a person's life here are the poetic devices in seven ages of man metaphor all the world's a stage and all men and women are merely players simile sighing like furnace creeping like a snail alliteration shrunk shank plays his part personification seeking the bubble reputation even in the canon's mouth the canon is an object so obviously cannot have a mouth what is moral philosophical literary approach moral philosophical critiques believe that larger purpose of literature is to teach morality and to probe philosophical issues matthew arnold said works must have high seriousness plato said literature must exhibit moralism and utilitarianism horace said literature should be delightful and instructive The moral philosophical literary approach is concerned with content and values. The concern is not only to discover meaning but also to determine whether works of literature are both true and significant. To study literature from the moral philosophical perspective is therefore to determine whether a work conveys a lesson or message and whether it can help readers lead better lives and improve your understanding of the world what ideas does the work contain how strongly does the work bring forth its ideas how may the ideas be evaluated intellectually what are the strengths and weaknesses of moral philosophical literary approach strengths this approach is useful in evaluating works which present an obvious moral philosophy It is also useful when considering the themes of works. For example, Man's Inhumanity to Man in Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. It does not view literature merely as art isolated from all moral implications. It recognizes that literature can affect readers, whether subtly or directly, and that the message of a work, and not just the decorous vehicle for that message, is important. weaknesses the approach can be too judgmental some believe that literature should be judged primarily on its artistic merits not its moral or philosophical content let's take a look at this story the boy who cried wolf once upon a time there was a shepherd boy who used to take his flock of sheep to the hill to graze on fresh green grass sitting there He had nothing to do the whole day. One day, an idea struck him. To overcome his boredom, he cried out, Wolf! Wolf! All the men came running with their sticks, and to their dismay, found no wolf. The boy laughed. The wolf, however, did truly come at last. The shepherd boy, now really alarmed, shouted in agony of terror, Pray do come and help me. The wolf is killing the sheep. But no one paid any heed to his cries, nor rendered any assistance. The wolf, having no cause of fear at his leisure, 
lacerated and destroyed the whole flock. What is the moral of the story? Did you figure out the theme? The boy lied so often that when he finally told the truth, no one believed him. The moral of the story is no one believes a liar, even when he speaks the truth. The philosophical approach doesn't look at a book as a piece of art with no moral implications. It says that literature can affect readers whether subtly or directly. It considers that the message of the story is at least as important as the story itself. Remember to think about using the philosophical approach when you're looking at a theme of a story or when you're reading a story that is obviously centered on a specific moral or truth. So what is Marxist literary approach? Marxist literary approach is a loose term describing literary criticism based on socialist and dialectic theories. It views literary works as reflections of the social institutions. Marxist literary approach focuses on how literary works are products of the economic and ideological determinants specific to that era. Critics examine the relationship of a literary product to actual economic and social reality of its time and place. Now let's talk about the proponents of Marxist literary approach. Marxist literary approach originates from the works of the 19th century German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Marx was a German political thinker who wrote about economics and politics. Marx thought if a place works together, runs on wage labor, then there would always be class struggle. Marxism is a political theory which focuses on the struggle between capitalists and working class. He believed that this conflict would immediately lead to a revolution in which the working class would overthrow the capitalist class and seize control of the economy. Marxists believe that if the working class makes itself the ruling class and destroys the basis for class society, there will be classless society. In Marxist society, there is no government anymore. In this theory, those who own property and means of production are the bourgeoisie, while the working class is called the proletariat. What are the goals of Marxist literary approach? The simplest goal of Marxist literary criticism include the following. 1. An assessment of the political tendency of a literary work determining whether its social content or its literary form are progressive. 2. Analyzing the class constructs demonstrated in the literature. Let's analyze a popular children's rhyme using Marxist literary approach. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Pat it, roll it, and mark it with a B. And put it in the oven for baby and me. This popular children's rhyme is a perfect example of ruling class versus working class. In the first line, you will notice that a rich man owns a big shop and has a baker. Going on in the next line, you will notice that the baker is instructed to bake a cake as fast as he can. This reflects the ideology of those in the ruling class that the working class should serve them as fast as they could. The ruling class believes that the baker should bake for them to save them from all the inconveniences. Unfortunately, the baker, typical worker of the working class, faithfully serves the ruling class all his life. What is feminist literary approach? Feminist literary approach focuses on female representation in literature, paying attention to female points of view, concerns, and values. Three underlying assumptions in this approach are 1. Western society is pervasively patriarchal, male-centered and controlled, and is organized in such a way as to subordinate women. 2. The concept of gender is socially constructed, not biologically determined. 3. 
patriarchal ideology pervades those writings which have been considered great works of literature. How is feminist literary approach used in analyzing a literary text? We use it by closely examining the portrayal of the characters both male and female. We investigate the language of the text, the attitude of the author, and the relationship between the characters. We also consider the comments the author seems to be making about society as a whole. For example, feminist critics may claim that certain male writers address their readers as if they were all men and exclude the female reader. What are the principles of feminist literary approach? It uses the principles and ideology of feminism to critique the language of literature. This thought seeks to analyze and describe the ways in which literature portrays the narrative of male domination by exploring the economic, social, political, and psychological forces embedded within literature. The specific goals of feminist criticism include both the development and discovery female tradition of writing and rediscovering of old texts, while also interpreting symbolism of women's writing so that it will be not lost or ignored by the male point of view and resisting sexism inherent in a majority of mainstream literature. What are the basic methods of literary criticism? Identifying female characters by examining the way female characters are defined, critics challenge the male-centered outlook of authors. Feminist literary criticism suggests that women in literature have been historically presented as objects seen from male perspective. Reevaluating literature and the world in which literature is read by revisiting the classic literature, the critic can question whether society has predominantly valued male authors, their literary works, because it has valued males more than females. Let's analyze this excerpt from the yellow paper. I don't like our room a bit. I wanted one downstairs that opened on the piazza and had roses all over the window and such pretty old-fashioned chintz hangings. But John would not hear of it. He said, there is only one window and not room for two beds and no near room for him if he took another. He is very careful and loving and hardly lets me steer without special direction. I have a scheduled prescription for each hour in the day. He takes all care from me, and so I feel basely ungrateful not to value it more. He said, we came here solely on my account, that I was to have perfect rest and all the air I could get. Your exercise depends on your strength, my dear, said he, and your food somewhat on your appetite, but air you can absorb all the time. So we took the nursery at the top of the house. The story was written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, a well-known American journalist and a female icon who fights for what she believes in, women's right. The yellow wallpaper can be looked at this gothic horror story and also a feminist parable, which gives us the idea that portrays the woman forced to obey her husband by all means, which causes her downfall to her mental sufferings. So what is historical literary approach? Historical criticism is the historical approach to literary criticism. It involves looking beyond the literature at the broader historical and cultural events occurring at the time the piece was written. An understanding of the world the author lived in allows for more comprehensive understanding of the work. What is the goal of historical literary approach? Historical criticism seeks greater understanding of biblical texts by analyzing the historical and social contexts in which they developed. The goal of historical criticism traditionally has been to try to understand the text's meaning in its original context and to answer questions about the text such as who wrote it? When was it written? What else was happening at the time of its writing? How did it come to be in the form we have it today? 
What did it mean to the people who first read or heard it? Historical criticism has also often soft answers to the ever-elusive question of what is called authorial intent. What did the author intend for his text to mean in his or her time and place? Let's talk about the methods of historical literary approach. Scholars use a variety of methods in attempting to answer these questions, all of which draw on the other fields of biblical and historical scholarship such as linguistics and archaeology. Three of the most widely used methods are 1. Source criticism Source criticism questions whether texts came from a singular source, author, or historical context and seeks to untangle the sources present within any given text. For example, source criticism reads the Gospel of Matthew with an eye towards what material came from other Gospels or from Matthew's own tradition. The Gospel of Matthew shares some material with the Gospel of Mark and other material with the Gospel of Luke. A source critic would be interested in which material is shared and how. 2. Form criticism. Form criticism seeks to understand the claims of a text by analyzing its linguistic patterns. For example, form criticism reads the Gospel of Matthew with an eye towards how certain words and expressions like the kingdom of heaven reflect the broader claims of the text. 3. Reduction criticism. Reduction criticism analyzes how reductors wove together various traditions into one whole. For example, reduction criticism reads the Gospel of Matthew with an eye toward how Matthew changes or uses material from other traditions, like the Gospel of Mark and Luke, to fit the text's broader claims. Let's study No Limitangere by Jose P. Rizal. Written in Spanish and published in 1887, Jose Rizal's Nolme Tangere played a crucial role in the political history of the Philippines. Drawing from experience, the conventions of the 19th century novel and the ideals of European liberalism, Rizal offered up a devastating critique of a society under Spanish colonial rule. The book indirectly influenced a revolution, although the author, Jose Rizal, advocated nonviolent means and only wanted direct representation to the Spanish government. The book was instrumental unifying Filipinos against the Spanish colonizers. So, I hope you learned something from our discussion today. I hope to see you again in our next video lesson. To get notified of the new video lessons, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and tap the notification bell. Bye everyone! Thanks for watching!